Josh uh, Benson and I have been working on this now since uh, about 2002 in that neighborhood. And uh, we operate a, a website, it's called findjody.com. And it's a very popular website. It's one that attracts a lot of people who are interested in the case of the abduction of Jody Usentrude. She was abducted from her parking lot on her way to work in June of 1995. So we have this, uh, uh, vast amount of information of people that we've interviewed, places we've been, uh, what other people have told us, and a lot of that we pass off to the authorities as well. But I think our site is probably the heaviest used, and uh, we like to think it's the most accurate site going. I could see at the end of last year that uh, uh, we needed something new. There has to be something to keep this story alive. And, uh, you know, we've tried everything we could think of. Uh, one night I got this great idea that uh, let's take, a, um, uh, take the information we have and, and safeguard it somehow so that it could be accessible for other people uh, who want to get that information. And then that was like a little, a little gremlin said to me, do a play. And I started thinking about doing a play and pretty soon I was talking to the Brave Community Theater and asking them about uh, a play, if they'd be interested in it, uh, about Jody Hoosentrude, and they jumped at the chance. So we're here tonight, we're gonna be doing auditions for all of the different parts in the play. It's already scheduled for the last weekend in June and on four different nights, so it should be an interesting time. Oh, the play is called uh, Fade to Black, Anybody who's familiar with uh, television terms uh, knows that when it fades to black, it fades to the end. And uh, that's, that's the name of the, of the play. And uh, it's going to have some surprise pieces in there, some surprise It's going ending. to be well. a very unusual presentation from the standpoint of uh, the actors and their experience with it and performing something that's a true story, obviously, and one that has such a intriguing history and it's also uh, going to be a challenge to put it together because we don't want it to be a documentary and so what I've been able to do is take all the information which is very substantial that Gary has given to me and that's like the hard news and what I'm doing is putting it together into a theatrical presentation and adding some softness and some I hope uh, more personalization of the story so, and it'll have a theatrical tone to it. It'll, it'll, I'm softening those harder edges um, with the presentation itself. And from an audience standpoint, it'll be incredible. I, I think it's gonna be something like they've never seen before. And we're gonna have a question and answer afterwards because there's a lot of questions that come up obviously with an unsolved case like. Jody is, I think, a very delightful person. And uh, Gary had a suggestion right away as to who to, put a cast as that and I think it was an incredibly important um, character because we want the audience to relate to her. She's not a statistic. She's a real human being and um, a delightful young person, so terribly young. And I think the enthusiasm that she had for her profession and the enthusiasm that she had for her life will come across and we want that to be a part of it. We, we want to convey that and the people that knew her. Her friends and her there family. are two things I think that are really interesting in this is that the uh, the age of Jody right now is going to be pretty close to the age of the person that we're looking at to play Jody. So we've captured that time frame, those years, and brought it forward to what Jody may look like now. Uh, we're not trying to have her double as Jody, but there's a very strong resemblance. And uh, that, that I think is going to be a, a very important part of this whole thing is that person, that key person that's gonna do Jody. Right. The other thing with the play is that to try and assimilate all of this information into a presentation that people don't go, yeah, I've read that before, I've heard that before, or, you know, yeah, I'm listening to the news, is, um, it has been kind of fun from my standpoint of putting it together because I'm used to writing fiction and, and yet doing some um, realistic and true stories that I've written before. But the first act um, is about the event, the people that knew her and so forth. The second part it, after the intermission is going to be 
um, the investi investigative side of it. And both of those, I think, are just going to get people talking and talking and, and uh, getting involved with it. You can't help but get involved. Some plays you watch, this one you're going to be involved with. And the date of it, one of the dates, is going to be June 27th, which, as you know, is the date that she was abducted. It's the anniversary, 15, or 17, 17 yeah. years. So we did that, Gary did that on purpose, actually, and, it, and it's worked out for the, for the Brave Community Theater to present that here in Spring Valley. And I think the fact that Gary's connected here, we're using local talent. There's not any professional actors or actresses or anybody coming in. And the interest has been very strong from all levels. In fact, I had people call me for tickets today. I said, that'd be great, but I don't even have them printed yet. Um, and, and I had people call me and email me from different, all sorts of different places as far as being in it or you know, coming to it or helping with it. Because we already are, that there's a, a tremendous amount of interest in this. Partially because she's sort of a local girl, being a Minnesota born and bred girl and, and having worked in you know, close proximity and, and so forth. Uh, you mentioned her name and people remember. I started with 100 pounds of sugar, you know? And I, and I kept weeding, uh, cutting it back, cutting it back, cutting it back. We ended up with probably 20 pounds right now. There are so many more stories that could be told that we just don't have time to tell. Or but, we can't uh, tell. Or we can tell. As you know, it is an open homicide case. This is still an active case in Mason City, Iowa. It isn't something that's just a figment of somebody's imagination that put together a bunch of facts. It is a homicide case. Uh, as you know, it is an active homicide, and it's uh, an active one with the Mason City Police Department and Saragota County Sheriff DCI. So any information that comes in is passed on to them, unless it's uh, definitely something that we've looked at before and put it aside. But any information that you have that uh, may relate to this case, I strongly suggest you call the Mason City Police Department uh, or a Department of Criminal Investigation. The case can't be settled. We cannot let this go unsolved. Four pages, so I didn't even know what right. part You have a script. And she's got like themselves and um, it's just it's been interesting. And so I think until you actually have to learn lines. Um, first thing I have you do is I think I have all your contact information. We'll be putting it all together and so I thought Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, um, three of those to put the whole thing together with tech should be fine. Now we might be rehearsing as a group some other time but it won't be like on a regular um, rehearsal schedule for a normal play. Intermission. So even with the intermission I think we figured an hour and a half 45 minutes. It's going to be at least that long. Without the question and answer. Okay. Only here at times and would like to have someone to share my life with. Sure, uh, I meet men, but none that really strikes me or who follow through. Halloween, 1994. <coughs> Jody met a neighbor who lived at Key Apartments, John Van Sipes a 40-year-old man who moved to Mason City from Newton, Iowa after getting a divorce from his wife, Rowena. He had been fired from his job as a seed corn salesman there, and he went to work for Pfizer Genetics in Mason City. I had to ask one of the neighbors who that cute girl was that was riding her moped and shorts, and I told her, her name, and I was told her name was Jody Husenshoe, and she was a news anchor. I knew one of the apartment residents had his eye on me. I met John on Halloween. He was a seed corn salesman and traveled all over. He also said that he liked to water ski and maybe we could go together sometime. I told him I had several friends that liked to water ski and he said I should ask them along. I think John had money, or at least he acted like it. John played the role with gusto. He purchased a boat. He had Jody's name painted on the back of it. It was quite a sight when John got all the girls in his $26,000 boat. John and I never really dated as such. It was always more of a planned gathering at the OP bar. That's where everyone from the TV station would gather and drink beer. 
and made friends with many new and exciting people. John always picked up my tab and sometimes we would dance right there in the bar. John loved to show me off. I'm starting fresh at work this week, getting up at 3 a.m. Best newscast in the world. Top 10 markets. I really think I'll market myself for Arizona. See what they think about my accent or I'll move down there to produce. On March, John Van Sice moved out of the key apartments and into a duplex that he had recently purchased. It is located at 510 and a half, 6th Street, Southeast in Mason City. I met Jody in Iowa City after we attended a Chamber of Commerce luncheon event. We love to party together and since neither of us like to cook, we love to eat at different restaurants. Jody's favorite place, I believe, uh, believe it or not, was Bonanza. You know, the big all-you-can-eat buffet. She could eat so much and never seemed to gain a pound. Jody made many friends. She was an outgoing person and had many male admirers. Many times she was the object of disagreements between several guys. She builds children. During, at a lounge, wild. It was in Clear Lake. They had a 16-gallon keg, huge keg with a skier. So much left. John Van Sice grilled 150 pork burgers. We were dancing on tables, dancing everywhere. Everyone had a ball. Video camera was rolling, cameras were clicking. Oh, what fun. Life is so good. The party made me feel so good. Last night, June 12, 1995, John and I went to the Glenn Miller Orchestra in Belmont. I have so many great viewers. People are so kind. This nice weather has me wild. I bought a new Merce Mazda Miata. Simply love it. July 1st. Schlieper says who's in true disappearance is being treated as an abduction. He says people saw a white van in the parking lot of her complex and heard a scream about the time she vanished. A reward fund reaches $11,000. July 2nd, investigators use helicopters to search Mason City in an area southwest of the city. Hughes and Truth's friends and her family join other worshipers for Sunday service at a Mason City church. Late in the day on July 3rd, police call off the ground and air search for Hughes and Truth, but say they'll continue interviews. July 6th. A Mason City martial arts instructor says Hoosentrude attended a self-defense course he taught in March. Sonny Ono says Hoosentrude told him she'd had an incident a few months back that she wasn't comfortable with. July 10th. Sleeper says an FBI behavioral scientist is trying to determine if the Hoosentrude case is linked with other disappearances of young women in the region. He says investigators have received more than 700 tips but no significant leads. To the police department, this was the beginning of what was to later prove to be the biggest case in Mason City Police Department history. July 25th. Schlieper says about 800 people have been interviewed in the case, but there's no solid suspects. August 3rd. Schlieper says more ground searches in the Mason City area have yielded no new leads. It's clear the culprit was watching Who's in Truth and knew her behavior patterns. Doug Murbach, KIMT News Director, says the station has not hired a replacement for Who's in Truth and officially lists her as on leave. About 250 people attended a candlelight vigil for Who's in Truth at a Mason City swimming pool. Businesses throughout the city continue to display yellow ribbons and fine Jody signs. On September 8th, Hughes and Trude family from Minnesota say they've hired a private investigator. Mason City Police continue to investigate leads and rumors. The Hughes and Trude Reward Fund at a Mason City bank grows to $30,000. September 23rd, the Hughes and Trude case is featured on national television show America's Most Wanted that generated more than 60 tips. November 13th, Members of the Hughes and Truth family say they flew to California and taped a session with three psychics for the television show Psychic Detectives. The psychic said Hughes and Truth kidnapper was someone who saw her on TV and became obsessed with her. Family members say three private investigators have, been found, have found nothing to identify a subject. December 9th, Sleeper says a search near two Mason City area dams turned up nothing. 
December 27th, the six month anniversary of Who's in Truth Disappearance passes with no new leads. KIMT staff members continue to fill in for her. Now the recover. The Who's in Truth case reaches the one year mark with no end in sight. A year has gone by, no credible leads. What I want to do is create this circle of information. It comes and it goes, and the time is passing. So by you guys marking June 25th or July, whatever it is, and a whole year goes, and look at it, at the end of that time, we have a physical thing on the stage that shows that passage of that first year information that may in fact lead to the solving of this case. So you guys are like on the groundbreaking edge of something. I mean, I really don't know of another open murder case that's ever been portrayed. And, I, and that gives me goosebumps every time. And there's another, mm -hmm. and there's another. And I'm a writer of all sorts of fiction and plays and, and real stories and human interest and all that. And I've read a ton of mystery um, novels. I don't think you could write this because there's so many connections and so many pieces of it that, like Gary said, this is another piece in the puzzle, the information that we got, which, you know, someday it'll be a full puzzle, I hope. But um, that's the thing, that's the challenge as actors that we have to bring out, is we have to keep it interesting. You have to play a lot of different parts, um, and, you, and you have to bring those parts and make them real to the people. They're not... I would really like to see you all look at the website, findjody.com. Look at it. You can go to all the stories that we did when we were at Channel 6, uh, Josh and Borland and myself. And, uh, we look at those and we piece together all the different personalities. So as actors, you will look at that and you'll find the role that you're probably going to be playing and look at it, uh, grind it in, start to think like that person. Think like, you know, try to put yourself in the place of, of Jody or John Van Sice or the police chief or somebody like that. They've all got different personalities. And it's, it's very important that you understand not just reading words in a script, but you actually say, hey, I'm feeling that part of the story. I've got that down. I know what this person is like. And once you get to that point, you're going to find it's, it's terribly exciting. And you're going to say, it's 8.20 on Sunday night. I'm not a good answer to that phone call. <laughs> but uh, do that. Look at that site because...